Today, if next week's Pentecost, what's today? It's Ascension Sunday. So it's hard to believe it's been that long since Easter already, but today is Ascension Sunday. Today is the day we celebrate, you know, when Christ, for a time in physical body, left this world. You know, the key verse is from the lectionary, and the key verse is, from, is Acts 1. Um, and I'm starting from Acts 1, 7 through 12 today. That's going to be my jumping off point. But you look at the lectionaries for this week, if anybody's been following along, and it's all been about the Lord reigning on high, being exalted, being lifted up, the worship that we've been singing today, um, King of Kings, Majesty, Alleluia, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. It's all about the Lord being lifted up and exalted. This is Acts 1, starting from verse 7. It should be up on the screen. Yeah, he said to the disciples, It's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. And this is why we get everyone to sit at the front, because those words are just a little small on the PowerPoint. But today on Ascension Sunday, I'm going to use this verse as a jumping off platform to speak about something that I don't think I've ever taught on before, and we don't often hear preached on very much, and that is actually heaven. You know, I bet you weren't thinking you'd get a sermon on heaven today when you got, when you got up this morning. But this is just where I felt myself being led over the last week as I was reading these verses. Because I believe that the disciples' question that prompted this response from Jesus, his response, and then how we saw the disciples' attitude change and what their actions changed until we get through to Revelation. You know, there's a lot of things that we can learn for how we live out our Christian faith now. And whilst the Bible leaves a lot of questions unanswered about heaven, we do really get to see a great picture of how heaven relates to earth and how that shapes our faith and our actions. So, but why am I talking about this? Because the more I read and the more I become aware of both the advancements and the suffering going on in this world. You know, we prayed about, you know, the youth being seduced by ISIL or, and going overseas and we see wars and we see, you know, we sometimes see this world caught in a spiral, a downward spiral. As you know, the Christians need to stand up against this and fight this, but how? But why? And I believe C.S. Lewis captured this why better than I could possibly craft. This is how he put it. And this is half a century ago, but this is how he put it. Next slide, thanks. Ron. He says, A continual looking forward to the eternal world, to heaven, is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one thing that a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought the most about the next. The apostles themselves who set, foot, who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, they all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were on heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they, have so, that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. This is wisdom from half a century ago and it could have been written for today's church. I want to flesh out what we can learn from focusing our eyes on heaven, on God's throne. I want to look, first of all, at the question that the disciples answered and why Jesus' response is so brilliant. And then I want to look at one other quote from C.S. Lewis. And he breaks the way that we see heaven down into four things. And I think we can learn something from each of those. 
So let's first look at the question. This is from this is one verse before what we had up before. The question was, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is the question that the disciples answered, or disciples asked. They wanted to know when God's kingdom was going to come. And Jesus responds, It's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and we will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now think about the context of this question being asked. The prevalent thinking of the Jews, which all the disciples were, was that the Messiah would come and restore the kingdom of Israel, or redeem the kingdom of Israel to what God had originally intended it to be. The Jews would look back at the golden age of David or Solomon. They would aspire to the perfect world of Eden. Israel would be the ruling nation and everything would be done Israel's way because God was in control and God loved Israel and God's chosen people were the Israelites. You know, they wanted, to go, they wanted God to reign, but they wanted Israel, you know, what they wanted that kingdom to be restored. You know, in business, we'd call that a potential conflict of interest. But this was the thought. And in dying and rising from the dead, Jesus had pretty convincingly shown that he indeed was the Messiah. So the question on everybody's lips was, well, Jesus, as the Messiah, you've got one job left to do. Where's this kingdom? When are you going to restore the kingdom? You're the Messiah. Finish the job. Now, it can sound as if you know, we can be a bit harsh on the disciples, but that's actually unfair. With all of the teaching they had grown up with since birth... This was not only a reasonable question, it was the only question that they, they wanted to ask Jesus as he was about to leave them one final time. They're looking around and whatever understanding of the kingdom that they had, and it would have been different from the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Zealots, but whatever understanding of the kingdom that they had, they looked around as they were standing there on that mount and they didn't see the kingdom being fulfilled. Caesar was still on the throne. In the zealots' kingdom, that shouldn't be happening. The corrupt court that had convicted Jesus and was in charge of the temple, they were still in charge of the temple. They were still in power. That's not meant to happen. Poverty was still rife. The sick, there was still sickness and illness. That's not meant to happen. Where is this kingdom, Jesus? You're the Messiah. Where is the kingdom? When are you bringing the kingdom? And yet Jesus' response, his response is something that they weren't expecting. When you look at all of the things Christ was saying over his years, it's the perfect capstone to all of his teaching ministry. He says to them, and it's still up on screen, it's not for you to know the time or dates. My Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He seems to want them to go somewhere. First of all, he gently puts them in their place. You don't need to know. That's not your job. Anybody who has ever said, I know when the end of the times, I know when the end time's coming, I know when God's coming back. Every religion that's ever said, I know the date, I know the time. Number one, liar. Number two, people tried that. When, 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 when? Not for you to know. Not your job. That's not what you should be sinking your time into. This is your job. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But it's weird. When we read through this, it feels like a bit of a... It feels like we missed a segue somewhere. It seems like this conversation was going along. How's the kingdom coming? How's the kingdom coming? You're going to get the Holy Spirit. It feels like Jesus missed a segue. It's like, hang on, here's one sentence and here's another. It reminded me as I was reading through this, when Carly and I were first dating, she went off to Japan for, you know, the best part of a year. It was a great time of growth for us. But while she was there, she became immersed in the culture and immersed in the way that, you know, the Japanese spoke and the way that they thought. And it's just different than, you know, the way that they converse. You know, they have one thought after, they have one, like they'll have one thought and then another and another and another and another. And it's up to the other person in the conversation to jump in. So if you're ever having a conversation, it's very hard. It can sometimes feel as if, We went here, and then here, and then here, and then here. Um, And there's no segue. There's no sort of smooth flow. 
And if you're used to that style of conversation, it's great. But if you're not used to it, for the first few weeks after Carly came back, I was trying to jump into a conversation because she wouldn't stop. And I was waiting for that breath. Is that what's going on here with Jesus? Is Jesus just having, you know, one thought? Oh, I'm about to ascend. I'm about to ascend. I've got to tell them something. Okay, no matter what question they ask, I'm just going to say this. Is that what's going on with Jesus? No. No. Throughout Jesus' teaching, he would often answer the underlying question that was in people's hearts before he answered, you know, the obvious question that had just been asked. You know, when people came and they brought the adulteress and they said, you know, what should we do with her? And what was his answer? He who's without sin, you cast the first stone. That's not a direct answer to what should we do with her, but it if what was in their hearts. You know, he answered what was truly in their hearts and they all turned and walked away and nobody threw anything. And the one person who would have been allowed to throw something, he chose grace, he chose forgiveness. Jesus would often do this. And so here, the same thing's going on. When is the kingdom coming? When is the kingdom going to arrive? Well, you've got the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you out on a mission field past Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's when the kingdom's going to arrive. Guess what, disciples? You've got a job to do still. And this would blow the disciples' minds. And I'd like to think that as they were standing there, just sort of gobsmacked, first of all, they didn't get the answer they were after, and then Jesus suddenly just starts... How is he doing that? I don't know, Peter, have you seen him do that before? No. As they saw him rise up and then they lose sight of him in a cloud. I'd like to think that... Hang on a second. Didn't Jesus say some parables about a ruler going away for a while to build his kingdom and leaving some servants behind to get on with the job? Didn't Jesus share even 11 parables in the book of Matthew that begin with the kingdom of heaven is like and there was always a ruler that would step out for a while and then come back. And whilst the disciples are still looking up going, where did he go? Where did he go? There two men arrive. Men of Galilee, they say, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you in heaven will come back the same way you have seen him go. And that would have been reinforced. All those parables, I think, would have come back into their mind. Hang on, this master is coming back. He's gone away to build his kingdom over here, and then he's going to come back. And for a time, he's left us in charge. I spoke of the parable of the talents, and if you read, especially in the Luke's retelling, since we're in Acts, um, a master or a man of noble birth, the son of nobility. He goes away to, for a while to build his kingdom, to be, pointed over, to be appointed king over another place. He leaves behind servants to build his kingdom here. And he leaves resources so they continue to work and build the kingdom. And then he returns. And those that have been faithful, he invites them into his kingdom, which in part is made up of what they were doing when he left them behind. Now, I certainly believe in a literal heaven, and a literal earth for that matter. Um, but you start to see this line, this blurring. You know, if we talk about God's kingdom, it's not just, well, God's kingdom's in heaven, and we're here on earth, and we just have to outlast earth until we get there. You start to see, you know, when Christ stepped into earth, when he died and then rose again and then ascended, this, this line of what is God's kingdom, it starts, and this line between heaven and earth, it starts to get a little blurry. It's not quite clean cut, and oh, God's working on everything in heaven. You know, who here heard that teaching growing up? Oh, God's preparing a room for us in heaven, and we just need to hold on. Who ever heard that teaching growing up? Yeah. I don't think it's as clear cut as that. He may be preparing a place for us, but he also left us here with a job to do, to build his kingdom. And when he comes back and we are invited into his kingdom, the work that we've done will continue on. 
and they're just closer to the king. And what's and if you continue on in that Luke reading, we see that heaven or the place where the followers go is likened to a collection of cities. And this draws me on to the second half of the insights that I was having this this week. You ever like read a quote from one author and you keep looking for other quotes by the same author? As I was doing that this week, I came across this other one from C.S. Lewis and I thought it was, again, a brilliant insight. He says this, The symbols under which heaven is presented to us are A. A dinner party B. A wedding C. A concert or C. A city and D. A concert A. A dinner party B. A wedding C. A city and D. A concert. And so this whole idea that we can sometimes be presented with in the media or in, you know, pop culture or whatever, where heaven is, you know, clouds and harps and pearly gates, you know, nothing against harpists, but I think an eternal harp recital would probably be my version of hell. I like harps, I like all stringed instruments, but a harp for eternity, especially if I was the one being forced to play it, <laughs> would not be. And my apologies to any harpist who's listening at the moment. Me playing a harp for all eternity would certainly be hell. <laughs> we'll see when we get there. I might have a long time to practice. Okay, but let's look, if we view heaven as these four things, which C.S. Lewis says is how the Bible presents heaven to us, what can we learn? The first one is a dinner party, and this is Matthew 22, verse 4. Then he, the king, he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and the fatted calf have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. Now, if you can't recall the parable, the master has prepared an epic banquet. There's, a, there's this dinner party and the oxen, the fattest calf, have been butchered and he sends out his servants out scattering invitations to everywhere. You come to the party, you come to the party, you come to the party. He sends his servants out everywhere saying, everything's ready, come in. But nobody wants to come. But what does the master do? He says, no, 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 my house will be full and he keeps sending the servants out again and again and again. Invite everyone you can, go to every back alley, go to every back street. Find everybody. My house will be filled. This will be the grandest dinner party or banquet ever. My house will be full is how that story ends. God wants us to, God is preparing, in one sense, an epic dinner party. Now, the analogy I have for this one is one that's actually born out of a bit of sad news this week. This week, the announcement was made that Easter Fest is no more. You know, the celebration of Easter, the celebration of Easter and of Christ's resurrection in Toowoomba, it's been called off for next year, and it's not looking good, you know, for the years after that, unless something drastic happens. And there was a tinge of pain there for me. You know, for a period of five or six years, I was actually on the tech team um, and the bump out crew for Easter Fest, and every year. All of us that had you know, joined together in this beforehand, we would gather, we'd come together as a team, we'd eat together as a team while we got a briefing. And there would be new people, but there'd also be this core of us that would come together and share stories and look forward to the great things God was going to do in, in amongst our midst. You know, and we would also try and rope our friends in for next year. You know, it was almost as if we were the Easter Fest evangelists. You know, we'd try to get more volunteers for the next one and more volunteers for the next one. I was recruited by Steve. Steve had been recruited by Tony um, and Bruce Moore. Um, I think they were recruited by the guy running it called Dave Shank. Um, so you just keep trying to recruit more people. But when you got there, it was this amazing experience and you would come back together and share and it's and it wasn't a banquet. You were normally sitting there, you know, getting food out of Bay Marie's, but coming together and joyfully sharing over a meal and telling of the stories and looking forward to what God was going to do. That was an experience. And the tinge and pain, the tinge of pain for me this week was that well, now with Easter Fest having been, you know, wrapped up, 
on this side of eternity, I'm never going to get to sit down with all of those people in that environment and enjoy that meal and enjoy that community. And although in recent years my time has been spent more and more on the Red Frog side than the Easterfest side, it's still something I was hoping to get back to. And now, you know, that won't happen this side of eternity. But heaven, heaven is where we will get to experience all of that again and again. And this is why we even celebrate communion. It's not just a reminder of the solemn night before Jesus was crucified. It's not even a reminder of all of the previous dinner meals. It's a foretaste of a grand dinner party where we can all come back together and regather centered on God and share and be a community with Christ in its center. Revelations tells us that at this party, every tribe, tongue, and nation will be represented. What a meal. You know, this has very real implications for us now. You know, Christians should be on the leading edge to get rid of, you know, every bit of discrimination, every bit of, you know, unhealthy nationalistic pride. You know, if there are groups of people, oh, I don't get along with, you know, I don't get along with those people, or I don't get along with those people, or I hate the people from that nation. That should be nowhere near the Christian's thought at all because if we can't stand them now, heaven's going to be very uncomfortable for us as we're seated around the same dinner table. Christians should be on the forefront of reconciliation. Christians should be on the forefront of breaking down those barriers and of acceptance and of loving our neighbour, which encompasses the whole world. Our right understanding of heaven as a dinner party should shape how we treat everybody on this world because they're the people we're going to be gathered around a table with for i don't know all eternity the other great there's another great insight to that um, is people when they ask oh what's heaven like you know will i recognize the people that i knew here you go, of course you will why would god instruct us to love people here if we can't come together at a dinner party and continue loving them there of course you will know the people that God has put here. If heaven is a dinner party, then this is just like, I don't know, the transit to get there. Um, so let's enjoy traveling together. And the other thing that we look at this as a dinner party is what did the master keep doing? No, 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 no. There's more invitations to go out. There's more invitations to go out. There's more invitations to go out. Now, you know, at the risk of going back to that joke, which was obviously funny, but also a little bit dangerous. Who here has ever invited anybody to a harp recital? No. Who? Awesome. Cool. Cool. Nice. Oh. <laughs> so now my analogy is falling completely flat. But but we've we've had one. That's so that's one. Who here has ever invited anybody to a dinner party? Yeah, everyone. Okay. So in our evangelical efforts, when we're talking to people about heaven and about God. Do you want me to tell you about a dinner party I'm having? you want me to tell you about a great dinner party that I'm going to go to? Yeah. I think, as far as outreach goes, the best opening line you can ever have is probably, hey, you want to come to a dinner party? And let's start with a literal one, where we can enjoy some great company and some great food. And then as they open up, let's start sharing about a figurative one as well. Carly and I are throwing a dinner party next Saturday, you know, and we've we've stacked the deck. We've got three Christian couples and one non-Christian couple there. And we'll just see how the conversation starts to we'll just see how the conversation starts to flow. Okay, the second thing, what what was the second thing that C.S. Lewis likened it to? It was a dinner party, a wedding. Awesome. Countless times throughout scripture, the church is described as the bride. And again in Revelations, all of creation is cheering as the groom, which is Jesus, takes his bride. Uh, Revelations 19.7 is the, is the key verse here. Our Lord God Almighty, he reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. 
And it's those last words that I want to look at. Reflecting on heaven, how they can guide us. His bride has made herself ready. Now, I was officiating at a wedding last Sunday. It's why I couldn't be here to join with what I heard was a wonderful Mother's Day event. Really sad that I couldn't get here. But I was officiating at this wedding. And it was just a small, intimate ceremony. There was only about 10 people, you know, photographer. It was a very small, intimate wedding. Um, but it was in a corner of a public park in Brisbane. So there were a lot of other people sort of glancing and looking on. Now, I can tell you what, they weren't looking at me. They weren't looking at him. They weren't looking at the groom. Who was everybody looking at? The bride, yeah. Okay. Now, she wasn't even in a traditional wedding dress, but everybody knew who the bride was. She was radiant. But you know what? Despite everybody's eyes being drawn to her, who had she prepared herself for? The groom. She hadn't prepared herself for everybody else. She hadn't prepared herself for me, other than trying to memorise some the, the vows that they were reading. She hadn't done any preparation. For her, all of her preparation and all of her attention was on the groom and what she could do to prepare for him. But because of that, because of that preparation, she was radiant and everybody's eyes was drawn to her. For those of us that have been married, we know the same thing. You know, as the groom, you stand up on the stage anxiously awaiting and everybody down, everybody down in the congregation, you know, they're just chatting, they're having a good chat. They're not really looking in the groom's direction at all. But as soon as the bride walks in that back door, every conversation stops, everybody turns. You know, Mark officiated my wedding and the same thing happened. You know, everybody turned to see Carly. I certainly turned to see Carly. But Carly hadn't done all the preparation for everybody that was sitting there. Carly had done all the preparation for me. At a wedding, especially as the bride, you can't fly under the radar. You can't live a life on a wedding day as if the groom doesn't matter. You just can't. There's no way a bride can rock up to a wedding and not be noticed. And the love and the passion and the preparation they've done for their groom to be noticed. It just can't happen. It cannot be done. As Christ's bride, as the church, are we called to prepare ourselves, to make ourselves ready for Christ, to put on those white garments, the holiness that God gives us, to live in such a way that we champion his name. You know, Carly does this wonderful thing for me. You know, she moves in so many business circles and she just drops my name, just drops my skill set, drops the name of the company. She, she's like a champion for me. She loves championing me and I do the same for her. Are we people that champion Christ in the way that a bride champions her husband? Are we a church that puts on holiness and radiance so that people see that we are different and because we are devoted to Jesus everybody notices like everybody notices a bride you know having this understanding of heaven as a wedding paints us as the bride so how does a bride prepare herself for the groom and then it affects everybody that can see her and the other thing is that post a wedding you know you have a marriage now Oh, yes. I thought I'd made a blooper then. I thought I'd gone around the wrong way. No, post a wedding, you have a marriage. And a great sermon that I've heard is that you have these two lives that started out devoted to themselves and they come together and they come together and then they are one story, never to be separated again, ideally, in a wedding or in a marriage. Isn't that again a great analogy for heaven? You know, it's as if this gap between heaven and earth, ever since Christ's resurrection, you know, we are, you know, we are here, but with our eyes on heaven, with our eyes on Christ, with our eyes on God. And where's God? 
well, obviously everywhere, but he's preparing a room for us focused on us. So it's like this is bride and this groom that were living separate trajectories, and now this gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I know it's just an analogy, but this is a great picture I have is that one day there won't be that gap anymore. And we will be with God. And he will be perfectly with us. And I think it's this great analogy that we can carry with us. And, you know, all that debate as to, well, will we be in heaven? Will we be on heaven on earth? Will God recreate everything? It's like, no, it doesn't matter. We will be wherever God is. And that is enough. It's this great analogy. It's a great picture of heaven. Okay, the third picture that we see is of a city. Uh, okay, so this is Revelations 21. Again, my apologies for the size on the screen. It says, Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. The first heaven, the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. There we go, as a bride again. Beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, as I said, we see that bride analogy again here. But there is this new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and God will now dwell with his people. And what's really interesting is God actually drops the city from the old heaven onto earth to dwell with us here. But I want us to have this verse in mind as we think back to the parable of the talents, as we think back to Matthew 22, where that we started with at the beginning of this sermon. You know, where the workers were working on the kingdom and then God comes back and invites them in. But what does he do? He said, you have been faithful in small things. Come in and be faithful in, and it's orders of magnitude more. You've been faithful managing a talent, so a year's worth of wages. Now come in and manage cities. Okay. What they did here affected what they would be doing in heaven, if you carry that analogy through here. Now just think about a city. A city is a very complicated thing, and, we're being, and we see heaven is being presented as a new Jerusalem, as a city. Now what does a city have? A city has great parks, it has great restaurants, it has great coffee. It has wonderful beaches, it has parks, but it has countless jobs that need doing. It has teachers, it has schools, you know. There are so many things that a city needs. Now, I don't know a city manager, I've never been a city manager, haven't worked in that sphere. But I was working at SEQ for quite a time, and the old CEO there, his name was Peter, he had a workforce of about 700 people underneath him. But he loved his job. But what he also loved was to see people who loved their jobs and excelled being put in the right spot so they could do those things and be faithful and true and use those gifts. And I can remember back then you know, he brought in this engineer called Barton. Uh, Barton was a great guy, actually used to play at Easterfest. I love it how you know these Christian circles just start to get intertwined. Um, but he was this brilliant engineer and he designed the spillway for Wyvernhoe Dam, the secondary spillway, that lets Wyvernhoe Dam store four times more water than Sydney Harbour. The guy was brilliant. But engineering was just in his blood. He loved it. He would just grab the junior engineers and anybody else around the office at the time and say, come over here, guys. And there's like a construction site next door. Let me tell you what's going on here. Let me build into you. Let me make you a bit better of an engineer, whether you were an engineer or not. Let me bring you over here and I'll teach you. I'll show you. you know? I'm quite sure that on occasion Barton had walked next door to the construction company and said, hey, there's a better way to do this. It was just in his blood. He loved being an engineer. There's not too many people you can say this about in the world, but I can say with absolutely assurity, God had made Barton to be an engineer. He was brilliant at it. And he made 
South East Queensland a better place for it. He made SEQ Water at that time a better place for it because he was there. Because God had given him gifts and abilities and he used them faithfully. And that will continue. Now think back to Matthew 22. The faithful servants who'd been faithful with the money, they had taken what they were good at and they'd used it for the master and then he invited them to come into his kingdom and manage things orders of magnitude larger. You've been faithful in small things. I'm going to put you in charge of much larger things. What we do here, the skills, the passions that God has given us, the way we use them, they will be part of eternity. Just imagine a heaven, if we're to make it as an analogous to a city, not where we all sit around, not where we sit and it's just an endless worship service. You know, I think our voices would at some point give out. But what if heaven is a place where, and I was really wishing he was here today because it would have been a great analogy. What if heaven was a place where Ross gets to figure out how to play every instrument? and then spends an eternity teaching that to everybody else in heaven so that they can glorify God with all those other instruments? What if heaven is a place where Mark can teach people better ways to think, new ways to think about God? And what if he gets to do that for eternity while sitting under other teachers who can do the same thing? You know, I look across here and I see quite a few nurses. Now, I don't, think they're more, I don't think there'll be a need for, say, nurses, but what if God says, well, in heaven, all nurses suddenly become personal trainers? Because I'm giving everybody a new body and they've got to figure out how to use them. They've got to figure out the best ways to get around in these new bodies. So all these people who were really passionate about seeing people get the most out of their bodies, Nurses, I made them and they're perfect at it. They're all going to become personal trainers as well. And they can work with those people. Like, imagine a heaven like that. Doesn't that sound so much more exciting than just sort of sitting and going, oh, great. I'm glad I got that earth thing done. Now I can sit in heaven. What way of seeing heaven is more exciting? That, like... This or, or that? If we're, going to talk to our, if we're going to talk to our friends and our family seriously about God and have serious conversations about heaven and eternity, which way should we present it? And, you know, and I'm not just picking for like wedding, city, dinner party. You know, this is what C.S. Lewis and many other scholars, N.T. Wright had a similar observation. This is how to view heaven. Isn't that a better way and a more attractive way to view it? Now, you know, I joke around about personal trainers and nurses and engineers. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's got something to do with spiritual gifts. I don't know what it's going to look like. But from the analogies that Jesus gave us in the parables, it's not just going to be sitting and doing nothing. God made the Garden of Eden with work still to do. He could have made the garden self-weeding, but he didn't. He said, Adam, Eve... Here's a garden. Take care of it. Work it. And that was before the fall. If Eden had work still to do, doesn't it make sense that heaven will be a place where work is still to be done? If God made us powerful and creative, isn't there going to be a place in heaven where we can actually create? If God made us teachers in his own image, isn't there going to be a place in heaven where we can teach? That just makes a lot more sense to me than just surviving this earth and then stopping. And then for the rest of eternity saying, God, thanks. It just makes a lot more sense to me to view it as a place where, things t where there are so many things to do. But we can do that without the suffering, without the pain, without the effects that sin has on this earth. That's a much better conversation to have t with our friends and our family about eternity. And then finally, it's presented as a concert. Now, I don't have a single Bible verse for this because it is just woven throughout all of Scripture. You open up the Psalms and it's just people singing to God. Like half of Revelations is singing to God, every bock in the Bible. There we go. That's my mistake for the day. <laughs> Had to come. Every book. 
pretty much every book in the Bible has people worshipping God or singing praises to God in one form or another. It only makes sense that all of eternity would be the same. I, I can remember that one of the first times I was worship leading, um, we had, and all the angels sin. <laughs> There's a G in there somewhere. <laughs> That's okay. But seeing heaven as a concert, who here has ever been to like a mega concert? And I'm not talking like 200 people in a pub or maybe a thousand people down at River Stage. Who here has ever been to, you know, a packed Lang Park um, for like the U2 concert they came through, or gone down to the Hillsong Conference where they've got 20,000 people packing out Acer Arena? Who, not just a Christian concert, but who here has ever been to just one of those massive concerts? Okay, I've got to tell you, the energy there is just electric. Because you've got like 20, 30, 40,000 people all focused on one spot. You know, the U2 concert, you know, their, their latest one. You know, you had everybody focused on this, on this stage in the round. And like all the light, like there's so much to watch at the concert, but everything was sort of focused in the middle there. And everybody was dancing together and moving together. It's like, you know, I can't get my two kids to cooperate. But you go to one of these concerts and you have 20 or 30,000 people moving in unison and focused on the stage and singing together. And even when the lead singer stopped singing, 20,000 people just kept it going. And praise in the Christian sphere, yeah, in praise and worship of our God. That's what heaven is going to be like. All these people who don't know each other from you know, a bar of soap sometimes, but all focused on whatever is at the centre. And in heaven that is God. And singing and moving and worshipping together. And as a real impact here on earth, you know, how often do we tragically see Christians fighting one another? How often do we see people getting into theological discussions and arguments and dragging it out into the public? Dragging it through the courts. You know, that's not bringing glory to God. That's not bringing glory to anybody. But you go to a concert, two people who might be worlds apart on so many things, for that time, they're united. They're united in their focus at whatever's on the centre. Should today's church be the same? You know what? We have our differences. We have our disagreements. You know, there does need to be dialogue where we disagree. But let's keep the central focus on God central, like a concert. You know, I've never gone to a concert where people got into fisticuffs as to what word that was. I've never gone to a state of origin where you had two Queensland supporters standing next to each other and they got into fisticuffs because they didn't agree on who was the better player. You know, if there was a blue supporter in the middle, then there would have been fisticuffs. But people you know, devoted to the same thing in the centre. That's what the church should represent. That's what the church should be like. Like we're all at a concert focused on God. And we're going to finish today's service with There is a Redeemer. I just wanted to just think about you know, that redemption idea just for a second as we close thinking about heaven. Ever since Christ you know, rose again, redeemed us, you know, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that, you know what, that started something and he's left us in charge of doing some of that work and seeing this earth redeemed. He will ultimately rede he has ultimately redeemed the whole earth. He will ultimately recreate heaven. But that gap between heaven and earth it's almost as if we're between two resurrections. You know, the first was Christ's resurrection where sin was taken care of. And then at the end, whenever that may be, the earth is restored to perfection. And we'll be living in that with Christ for all eternity.
So we're going to close with there is a redeemer. Um, and then after we go from here, I'd like you just to keep those four analogies in your mind. A concert, a wedding, a city, and a dinner party. And I think, you know, that's what lies before us. And I'd love to have that lie before our friends and our family who don't yet know God. And, you know, perhaps, just perhaps, you might actually invite a friend or two to an actual dinner party and see where that conversation goes.